Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us today for, uh, for this webinar um, that is organized uh, by the European Toolkit for Schools, which is part of the European Commission's platform uh, School Education Gateway, and it's also organized in collaboration with the Nesset Network. Um, my name is Cosmi Nada, and I'm going to be your host today. I'm a research fellow at the Center for Research and Intervention in Education at the University of Porto, and I'm also an editorial board member of the European Toolkit for Schools and administrative coordinator of the Nesset Network, which is the network of experts working on the social dimension of education and training. Uh, you will hear more about the Nesset Network because the webinar is uh, also based in an analytical report that uh, the Nesset Network has recently produced. Um, about the European Toolkit for Schools, you might know that it compiles promising practices in the field of inclusive education into the same flat platform that you can consult online and uh, my colleagues uh, are going to share with you the link. Um, recently, a good practice video from a school in Portugal that is doing very interesting work and is also connected with the topic of our webinar uh, on well-being today has been launched. And I encourage you to watch this video after our webinar. You will also have uh, the link to the video in the chat. Uh, this webinar connects as well with the Commission's latest initiative entitled Pathways to School Success, which seeks to tackle early school living, basic skills under achievement, and mental health and well-being. Uh, some of you may know this initiative since it was in the process of public consultation a few months ago. Uh, Pathways to School Success is, in my opinion, in a change in the way we see uh, education. So rather than focusing on specific problems, often in a rather disconnected manner, we look at the elements that enhance school success and also broaden uh, our understanding of what success is. So we have uh, gathered here today to discuss a particularly relevant topic, mental health and well-being. And we all know that uh, these are particularly challenging times for children and young people in Europe and across the world. In fact, a recent consultation conducted by the EU and the UNICEF involving um, more than 10,000 children revealed that one in five children were showing signs of depression or were growing up unhappy and anxious about their futures. Similarly, the World Health Organization conducted a study according to which 40% of 15-year-olds in Europe often feel low, nervous, or anxious. Of course, the COVID pandemic had a significant impact uh, here since it brought numerous challenges to, to us all, and especially to young people. Uh, recently, it has become more and more common for, for me, for instance, to read headlines in, in the newspapers about uh, children's and young people's mental health. One of such headlines uh, says, one in seven young people has a mental disorder. Or another headline reads, a future of instability and insecurity and a pandemic. 23% of young people already attempted or considered suicide. In this context, we have been uh, hearing a lot about this mental health emergency or what is called the silent pandemic that uh, seems to be spreading across the EU and beyond. And in this context, uh, what we can expect from educational institutions? Is there anything that they can do? Uh, we know that already in the 70s, uh, Basil Bernstein told us that education cannot compensate for society. But of course, this doesn't mean that nothing can be done at the school level. So one of the questions that we can approach today with the help of our respected and knowledgeable guests is what can schools do to promote the mental health and well-being of young people and the entire school community? Uh, first, we will listen to Carmel Chefai and Celeste Simões, which are the authors of a recent Nesset report entitled, exactly as the webinar today, A Systematic Whole School Approach to Mental Health and Well-Being in Schools in the EU. Then we will hear from Nadine Toy, who will bring us the perspective of young people on these issues. So, proceeding with, uh, with our first guest, uh, Carmel Chefai is the founding director of the Center for Resilience and Social Emotional um, Health and professor at the University of Malta. 
He is a joint honorary chair of the European Network for Social and Emotional Competence and joint founding director of the International Journal of Emotional Education. He is also a member of the NESET coordination team. His research interests are focused on how to create healthy spaces that, pro that promote resilience, well-being and mental health of children and young people. Uh, his colleague, Celeste de Simões, is an associate professor at the University of Lisbon and a member of the Environmental Health Institute Research Center at the Faculty of Medicine in Lisbon. She is also a researcher of the Social Adventure Project and her main areas of interest are social and emotional education, resilience, health promotion in schools and risk behaviors in adolescents. So now I would like to, to give the floor to, to our speakers uh, to present us the findings of uh, the most recent uh, NESET analytical report on uh, well-being and mental health. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Hello, everyone. If we can have the PowerPoint, please. Upload it. Uh, yes, can you please click take control? Do you see the button? Ah, OK, one second. Yes. OK. OK, so good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to thank um, Cosmen, who on behalf of NESET and the European Toolkit for Schools invited us, um, me and Celeste, my colleague, who are co-authors of this report, to um, present the main findings of the report. Um, as Cosmin very well said, um, there is an increasing movement in Europe and other parts of the globe for education to go beyond narrow sectoral goals, such as academic achievement, and contribute more actively to the realities young people and children are facing today. And here, more specifically, and we are talking about the well-being of children and young people as their well-being and mental health needs are becoming more evident and demanding, as um, Cosmin very well said with those percentages. Um, if we have a strategic focus on well-being in education, this also helps us um, in the realization of the sustainable developmental goal for point A, which is about inclusive and safe schools, and 3.4, which is about mental health and well-being, as well as children's rights to health, protection, and participation. Um, a focus on well-being in schools also helps to avoid um, inequity, poverty, discrimination, marginalization, and exclusion. And as you know, these are key targets in the EU policies. Um, one of the reasons also that there is uh, um, COVID, uh, sorry, Cosmin mentioned um, uh, the pandemic, which has promoted um, mental health, um, increased the interest in mental health in schools, and as well the high um, incidence of mental health problems. There is also another reason for the um, interest in mental health promotion in schools is the evidence, which is coming out about its effectiveness. For example, there is evidence, increasing evidence of the impact of well-being interventions in schools on students' sense of belonging to school and commitment to school, enhanced motivation and higher academic achievement. And this also leads, um, therefore, to the prevention of early school leaving. There is also um, um, consistent evidence that schools are in a unique position because they have for a, 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 a very particular time in children's lives and they also have a broad reach. They have basically um, capture all children and young people to effectively promote the mental health and well-being of children and adolescents and very important to prevent the emergence and development of mental health issues at critical periods um, during children's development. Okay, so um, basically um, the report which we um, developed um, for NESET um, earlier this year is in response to the recognized need for schools across Europe 
to prioritize and actively promote the well-being of all school children within safe and inclusive contexts. How did we go about this? On the basis of a review of the international literature, um, especially recent literature, last, like last 10 years, and in view of also the EU policies, communications and actions in this area, we developed a theoretical framework which will help to guide schools in, um, in collaboration with the community to organize themselves as, as a whole school system to promote mental health and well-being. And in fact, my colleague Celeste will be telling us a little bit more about this framework. And then we also made in the report a, a number of recommendations for the effective implementation of a systemic whole school approach to the promotion of mental health and well-being and the prevention of bullying in schools. And later on, I will come back and talk to um, uh, a little bit more about these recommendations. But now I um, leave it to my colleague Celeste to tell us a little bit about the theor theoretical framework which was developed in this report. So good afternoon to you all. I would like, as Carmel mentioned, thank you Cosmin and Neset the opportunity to, to be here today and to um, collaborate in this in this project that was this this report that we we prepared along with another colleague um, together um, in this in this uh, journey of of uh, reviewing the literature and uh, present these results. So as Carmel said, we developed this uh, framework for a whole school approach to mental health and well-being uh, based on the recent studies and the current European uh, European Union policies, the communications and the reports, uh, and that was the basis for the development of this uh, framework. This framework focused on the universal mental health and well-being interventions at curricular and contextual levels for all school children as a major goal of school, complemented by targeted interventions for students at risk or students that are experiencing mental health difficulties. Uh, in addition, the framework also focuses on education, mental health and well-being of adults who work with uh, school children, namely teachers and parents. Sorry that I took control, but I didn't change the, the, the slide. Let me do this. So now we are in the right slide. Um, so as I said, um, besides the universal and the target uh, interventions, the framework also focuses on education, mental health and well-being of adults who work with, uh, with school children, namely teachers and parents, uh, involving this way the whole school community. So this all uh, school approach to mental health and well-being framework encompasses a series uh, of components, namely a set of principles uh, that inform the framework. I am experiencing some problems in moving on the 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 the, the presentation. I don't. Okay, now okay, the principles. So they come all together. Uh, so a set of principles that informs the framework, a set of three concentric layers more proximal or distant to the students, representing the critical components at different levels, and these layers influence and contribute to another, and the sustainability processes supporting the whole school approach. So these are the three uh, um, main components of the framework. If we look more in depth at these three components and starting with the principles, a set of 11 principles inform the framework, namely children and young people rights to health care, quality education, protection and participation, among others, holistic education that addresses the challenges of the 21st century, the principle that uh, refers that intervention should be health and strength based to support children and young people uh, to remain healthy and thrive academically, socially and emotionally. It should be organized within a systemic all school approach, inclusive and equity driven so that all 
provide equal opportunities to address their needs, culturally relevant, adapted to the diverse needs of the school population that is becoming more socially and culturally diverse, bottom-up participative based on the principles of empowerment, democracy and ownership, relational, focusing more on social and relational processes such as interpersonal uh, relationships, connectedness and the sense of belonging and less on policies and structures, multi and transdisciplinary since schools need to collaborate closely uh, with various professionals and mental health services to address uh, the intricate needs of uh, vulnerable and marginalized students addressing the well-being of adults, like was uh, previously uh, referred, and provide them opportunities for personal and professional development and parenting education, among others. And finally, listen to students' voice, supporting them to become more autonomous in their learning, express their opinions and suggestions, and be more actively involved in school processes. So now moving to the key components uh, and starting with the most proximal layer, the classroom uh, layer, it includes three elements. The universal curriculum with an explicit focus on educating children to make healthy uh, choices and promote their health and well-being. The curriculum includes social and emotional education, resilience building and mental health literacy from early years to high school. Classroom climate, another key component, where foundational processes like supportive peer relationships, inclusive practices, caring teachers, uh, student relationships, and active engagement in meaningful activities and collaborative learning, just to mention some of them, are essential for mental health and well being. And the last one in this layer, teacher education and mentoring, essential to a quality curriculum implementation and positive student outcomes. Um, and in this scope, when we look at the contents for this, this, this training, uh, we can highlight contents like understanding children and uh, uh, young people's social and emotional development, the implementation of mental health programs in the classroom, addressing bullying, working collaboratively uh, with colleagues, parents and professionals, identifying symptoms of mental health difficulties in students, just to mention some of the crucial elements that uh, this, this education uh, can uh, or should encompass. So moving to the second layer, the school layer includes four elements school climate that operates at, uh, as a health promoting context in, um, in which school um, members should feel free, uh, respected, recognized, supported, connected, included and safe. Key aspects of school climate are, for instance, a sense of physical and psychological safety at school, mutual respect, inclusion, equality, kindness and solidarity, which need to be embedded, these key aspects, across the whole school. All school members need to feel protected from prejudice, discrimination, violence or harassment and bullying. The second element, uh, student engagement, since students need to be active partners in the mental health and well-being school project, and as such, to, uh, student engagement is a fundamental component. Their participation can go from planning, implementing and evaluating initiatives like policies, practices and programs, to delivering interventions such as peer-mediated uh, support for mental health. The third element in this school layer is close collaboration with parents and community and their active engagement. Um, that is one of the three pillars of the WHO health promotion framework in schools. Uh, in this scope, schools need to take a more empowering and culturally responsive approach when collaborating with parents and be more responsive to their needs, uh, views, including those uh, from marginalized backgrounds that many times are left out. And finally, the fourth component of the school layer, teachers and other staff well-being. 
that needs also to be considered since it influenced the school community relationships and the classroom and school climate. A whole school approach consequently uh, considers the well-being of the staff as uh, a paramount to their effectiveness of this approach. The last layer, the intersectoral layer, encompasses three elements. The first, the targeted interventions for students at risk or experiencing mental health difficulties as part of an integrated approach to school mental health and well-being. And this intervention should begin as early as possible and involve the contribution and the support of professional and uh, agencies. Sometimes uh, these, these uh, target uh, um, uh, interventions um, may lead teachers to feel that their role is not so important, but if, uh, effectively the, the role uh, uh, of the support staff and professionals outside school is um, quite central, but uh, teachers still have an active role in supporting the needs of these, uh, these students, as well as their, their parents um, to, to, to lead this project to a good term. Partnerships with professionals and agencies are also a vital element uh, of these layers since schools need to work in close collaboration with the various professionals and mental health services to address uh, the complex needs of more, the, the, the more vulnerable and marginalized students. Um, as it was mentioned uh, previously. Uh, an intersectoral approach in which professionals, school staff, parents and students work collaboratively as a team uh, seems to ensure that the interventions are child-centered rather than service or profession-centered and that they remain school-based rather than clinical-based. Uh, and finally, in this layer, partnerships with the local community that act as mental health services providers, disseminate information, organize or co-organize complementary health promotion activities for family, children and young people. And so they have a key role uh, in mental health promotion. Uh, but the community involvement is also crucial in other um, uh, domains, like in helping to reduce prejudice and stigmatization towards mental health issues and changing social norms that may put children and families at risk of mental health problems. Finally, we have the sustainability that is composed by three main um, processes. The first one, the quality of implementation that is considered one of the challenge for the success of the old school approach. It includes planning, implementation, monitoring and support. Um, in this, uh, in this uh, process, supportive policies, structures and practices are key elements to sustain the quality of implementation uh, and the project in the long run. This uh, generally requires leadership and organizational support to drive the change and embed interventions into the structure and life of the schools to uh, continue at the long run. The second process, a participatory and flexible approach rooted in the school context, requires an active involvement of the whole school community. Uh, some authors argue that a participatory, flexible, bottom-up approach is more likely to be successful uh, and sustainable in European uh, schools. However, a bottom-up approach is often challenging uh, to implement and subject to staff resistance and uh, again, uh, an adequate teacher, te te teacher education and support uh, is also crucial um, to the success of this old school approach. And to end with this, the presentation of the framework and this sustainability process, support from local, regional and national authorities. Uh, since the old school approach demands significant resources and cultural change, uh, place high pressure on school over an extended period of time, uh, this support is uh, fundamental. Um, old school interventions, uh, as mentioned by and referred by liter the literature, are more likely to be successful when supported by these authorities, both in terms of advocacy for policies that recommend a old school approach to mental health 
and through resourcing. And so this is our uh, framework, the framework that is presented in the report. And now I give the words to Carmel to move on with the recommendations. Thank you for your attention. Um, something so happened happen. with the presentation. Yes, just, just, just a minute. minute. Uh, I, might I will, have... will re-upload re the file. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so thank you, Celeste, for that. Um, now, in the last part, we'll have a look at um, some of the recommendations on how I take control. OK. Um, of, on how um, this framework can be put into practice in schools. So these are recommendations for educational authorities, for schools, for teachers. Um, we have we have limited time, so I will go very briefly on these 10 recommendations. If you would like, like to know more about them, they are um, presented in more detail in our report. OK. So, um, OK. So the first recommendation is um, the obvious one that well-being and mental health promotion needs to be established as a mandatory key learning goal in 21st century education in Europe, integrated into the curriculum and supported by a systemic whole school approach. Research shows in order to be effective, this approach needs to be implemented well with training, support and so on, is integrated into the fabric of the school context embedded and sustained over time. Second um, recommendation is to increase the importance and value of mental health and well-being. And one way of doing that is in, um, to include it in the evaluation of what makes an effective and successful schools besides successful um, academic achievement. However, we have to be careful here that the way we organize the, um, the assessment evaluation, we do not repeat the mistakes of the past, where we will um, start to label um, and children and schools and teachers as failures or have problems with mental health well-being assessment on the other hand so we have to be careful about high risk um, assessment high stakes assessment sorry so it has to be formative inclusive and systemic the third um, recommendation is um, to do to make sure what we are already doing in mainstream education we are doing it well because mainstream educational practices these also promote or should promote mental health and well-being so teaching practices that foster connectedness relationships and so on collaboration active student participation culturally responsive and inclusive practices these are these practices are the building blocks for both academic learning and social emotional competence and well-being and such practices fall within the remit of all school teachers. OK. Um, as uh, Celeste well mentioned in the uh, framework, we found also on the base of the literature that relatedness and connectedness are at the heart of well-being and mental health promotion. A ethic of relatedness and care fostered by respectful, caring and supportive relationships among and between various school members. So we are here talking about students and teachers, but also among students themselves, among teachers, staff themselves, among between administration and, and school staff, between school and parents. OK, these kinds of relationships create help to create healthy spaces in which individuals can grow and thrive. Five, as Celeste mentioned in the framework, we strongly recommend in this um, report a bottom up participatory approach which fits, is tailored to the ecology of the school and the local community. Okay, in this respect, this is far more likely to be meaningful, to be owned, and therefore to be effective. Teachers, students, parents, and the local community need to be actively involved in the planning and implementation of programs of initiatives related to mental health. 
Um, we would like to emphasize within this framework the student voice in particular, because most of the time these are the most disempowered, disenfranchised um, stakeholders. So a strong and representative, including students who are marginalized, student voice will include co-designing of materials, participation in the implementation of um, interventions, participation in decision making and also supporting their peers, their mental health and well-being. Six, um, we talked about safe environments, so involving the whole school community in tailoring interventions to prevent bullying. Okay, Within a whole school approach to bullying with priority actions at both universal prevention, so this is very effective to create a culture where bullying um, um, does not take place. Okay, perpetrators are discouraged um, from um, engaging in bullying, and also focus especially on bystanders. The top research now is focusing on the role, and also complement it with targeted interventions because victims of um, um, bullying many times they need um, support. Seven. Um, there is um, a need for a strategic focus on the mental health needs of vulnerable and marginalized students. Okay, and schools are in a unique position to prevent the onset of mental health problems and address the mental health needs of vulnerable students to preventive and resilience building interventions at a critical time before these problems become more complex and chronic. And uh, research is showing us that early adolescence, there is a window of opportunity for schools to make a difference in children's life, to prevent the development of mental health um, problems in young people. Such interventions, however, need to be implemented within an inclusive setting, avoiding labeling and stigmatization. Related to this, the eighth recommendation is school-based intersectoral support for students with mental health needs. Celeste made explain this very well in the framework. And here we are talking about close collaboration with mental health and other related services to ensure that the mental health needs of students are addressed within a transdisciplinary, intersectoral, but school-based approach. Okay? It is essential, however, that such interventions are accessible to all students responsive to the needs of the particular students and school community that are appropriate and also equitable okay for all students coming from different backgrounds nine um celeste well mentioned as well um we need a very clear message from the evidence to prioritize teacher education in mental health and well-being if we want teachers to support the mental health and well-being of their students schools are administration local needs to support the mental health and training and well-being of teachers and teacher education in particular needs to be a transformative personal and social developmental process i think this is very important that teachers will have the opportunity during their training both in early in um, initial teacher education at university or college but also at their place of work to work on their own biases issues they might have Okay, to how to develop um, healthy relationships, how to be effective communicators, how to resolve conflict management. These are very important skills so that they can then help to promote a classroom climate which promotes mental health and well-being. Um, we also recommend that there will be national frameworks, um, both at initial teacher education in universities and colleges, but also local educational authorities on the key educator competencies which every teacher will need to have in order for the effective delivery of mental health and well-being in schools. And finally, of course, teachers need to be supported to do this. So there needs to be mentoring programs, professional networks, learning communities to provide a collaborative learning platform environment where children, teachers share and support each other. The final conclusion is related to this. Um, to address the mental health and well-being of adults as well. So besides education, teacher education, teachers also need the active support from authorities, administration and colleagues to deal effectively with the challenges and, str and stresses of the profession and to take care of their health and well-being. And there is a lot of research, for example, on mindfulness, mentoring, 
okay, collegiality. And similarly, um, parents, schools need to encourage and empower parents in parental education okay, and in taking care of their own health and well-being. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Carmel. Thank you, Slash, for the for this very very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, we are a little bit uh, behind the clock, but I think it was worthy because uh, it was clearly visible how complex uh, the report that you have produced and this uh, this framework is, and uh, all these recommendations that that you just presented uh, required uh, some time to to be explained. So I think it's uh, we we used the time uh, wisely. Uh, before uh, I hand over to, um, to Nadine, uh, I would like also to, to consult uh, the audience um, also on this, uh, on this issue, because it seems to me that from what we have seen in your report, uh, Carmel and Slash, is that uh, we know to some extent what needs to be done, but at the same time we are uh, uh, suffering this uh, silent pandemic that I was uh, mentioning at the beginning and we keep hearing about all these mental health uh, concerns regarding uh, children and young people. Uh, so it would be interesting to know uh, to which extent are mental health and well-being considered in your school, in your institution, if uh, the people in the audience uh, do not belong to schools, they can refer to, to the institution in which uh, they work at the moment. So now I'm going to launch this, uh, this Mentimeter that you can access uh, by going to menti.com and inserting the code that is written on the screen. And I'm going to share my screen now and I hope that you are able to to see that the uh, answers uh, are, are already coming. So the answer options are mental health and well-being are part of my schools or institutions core strategy. Mental health and well-being are addressed, but in a rather sparse and isolated way, or mental health and well-being are not addressed in my school institution uh, at all. So, Far, I see four, uh, four answers, and I know that we are around 50 people, so I'm going to, to leave the Mentimeter open for you to vote uh, for uh, a few more seconds to see if we manage to get at least uh, half uh, of, of the participants today to reply to this, uh, to this question. If there are any troubles in uh, in finding the, in the instructions, as I mentioned, they are on the top part of the screen. So access menti.com and use the code that is written on the screen. I see that uh, for now the the balance is uh, more inclined towards mental health and well-being being addressed, but rather sparsely and uh, in, a, in an isolated way. Uh, one participant just uh, just replied that uh, well-being and mental health are, are part of, of their institution's core strategy, which is encouraging, but still it's the only, only answer in, uh, in that direction. So, uh, and we also have a few, a few answers indicating that mental health and well-being are not addressed at all uh, in, their, in their school and, uh, and institutions. So I think this is, uh, it's, it's interesting uh, considering the knowledge that, um, uh, that was shared by, by Carmel and Celeste on what needs to be done, that now it seems that, uh, that we are somehow stuck at the implementation stage. But it's also encouraging to see that uh, even if addressed rather in an isolated way, that mental health and well-being are becoming a concern in, in most schools and, uh, and educational institutions. Um, now I will uh, then uh, present uh, Nadine, who is a very, very engaged uh, young person who has been working on, on these topics. Uh, Nadine is a board member of the Organizing Bureau of European School Student Unions. 
uh, which represents school, school students' rights in Europe and advocates toward the European institutions and other relevant stakeholders in the field of education. Nadim's work links to areas such as mental health, school students' experiences during co the COVID pandemic, and many other topics which relate to representing the school students of Europe. Recently, Nadine has led a task force of school students to research the effects of COVID-19 on education and student well-being. So, Nadine, I will uh, hand over for your presentation and I would also like you to react, if possible, together with the content that you prepared uh, for us today. Also, from the perspective of, of a, a young person that was quite recently uh, in school and uh, how uh, you experienced these uh, mental health and well-being issues, uh, they were addressed in your own institution by uh, other institutions that you are aware of. So a little bit bringing the, um, the perspective of young people to the table since the first part of the webinar, we heard more the academic and uh, uh, data, uh, solid data perspectives. It would be interesting to have also your uh, um, contribution in that sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cosmin. Um, so my name is Nadine Toy and I am a member of the Organising Bureau of European School Student Union's um, board um, and I'm from Ireland and I'm 21 years old. So basically what I'll be presenting today is that last year we worked on this uh, research document alongside our secretariat um, and the research document is made to ensure that we listen to the school students perspective when evaluating the COVID-19 pandemic and education of course as well during the pandemic and um, so in the report that we have created there's a lot of new stuff that hasn't been seen before as well as confirming some other things that's been found along the way um, so we used a different a range of different uh, methodology and research methodology whenever we were compiling the research and compiling the database for the document and I'll go through all of that now in a minute and there'll be a space as well for questions for myself and for the other presenters as well at the end of the presentation um, so first, just to give a little bit of an insight into OBESU and what it is. So um, OBESU is the Organising Bureau of European School Student Unions and we work with um, students from all over Europe um, in different kinds of secondary education. Um, we are the umbrella body for national student unions and together they collaborate and they can work together um, through our platform uh, to achieve their goals. and. We have at the minute 34 members um, from from Austria and from Belgium, from Bosnia, Herzegovina, from Czech Republic and Denmark, uh, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Moldova, um, Italy, Kosovo, um, Lithuania, uh, Serbia, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Spain, Spain, Switzerland, Turkey and the UK. And we were founded in Dublin in 1995. And we've been working to represent um, school student rights ever since then. And we advocate as well for high quality education for everyone, despite their uh, background or other challenges that they might face in line with education. And this research that I'll be presenting today uh, was mainly compiled by the OBESU board, um, the OBESU secretariat, so our staff, and we had a task force also on uh, COVID-19 research, uh, which were made up of members of our member organisations. Um, so just on the document itself, so the document is titled Three Schools Student Eyes, Eyes and Packs and Challenges of COVID-19 on Education Systems in Europe. Um, so in this document, we delve into the school students' experience of education during the pandemic um, with a focus, of course, on online education. And for us, it was really, really important to investigate this um, side of things is that we can see so often time and time again how school students are overlooked and kind of completely forgotten about by the national governments and education systems and we saw that there was a space um, to ensure that school student rights were heard and the school students perspective was heard as well in the pandemic and the pandemic itself saw one of the biggest disruptions to education since the second world war so that's huge that over 17 million students 
were affected by the school closures um, during the pandemic. So that's like 17 million students who missed out on not just their education, but also meeting with friends, leaving their home, having the chance to engage with normality. Um, and this report looks into this um, through involving a six month inquiry and using different methods and involving over 1000 students and teachers from many different European countries. Um, so just to go a wee bit into our methodology, so our research methodology could be split into three different main categories. And um, so our first categories would be our focus groups and interviews. So we had six focus groups and three interviews um, involving students and teachers from 13 different countries in Europe. And we had a fairly relative um, balance of gender and urban and rural and age group as well. And where possible in the interviews and in the focus groups, we conducted the um, the focus group and the interviews in the mother tongue of the participants um, so that they feel more comfortable answering and so that they'd be able to express their um, opinions and express their experiences fully and to their best uh, capability. And then our second category would be uh, consultations of our member organisations. Um, so we have two statutory events a year. Um, this is a general assembly and our council of members. And we consulted all of our member organisations at two general assemblies and one council of members um, over the past two years and got them to say what was going on on a national level in their countries and with their specific type of education. Um, and then lastly, we had our survey, which reached over 1000 students and the survey itself was translated into uh, four different languages. It was translated into English, Spanish, French and Italian, and it contained many different kinds of questions that had closed close questions that had open ended questions and multiple choice. And it kind of gave it that opportunity as well to for everyone to answer in a way that was most comfortable for them because it was translated into so many different languages as well. Um, so these research methodologies allowed us to look at both the individual student itself, as well as through our member organisations, look at how things are going on a complete national level. Um, so I'll just go through some of the data from our surveys um, of our respondents. So you can see here the age group of our respondents here. We go as young as 12 and up to 21. Um, so and then three quarters of that is in between 30 or between 15 and 18 sorry and um, so you can kind of see it's a, it's a little bit dispersed and you have the older students there kind of representing the vocational educational training and then the younger school students as well which is nice to see too and moving forward we can see that there is a massive um, majority of female students so there's about 70 percent um, of the students that were actually surveyed was uh, female um, it's just the way it ended up I suppose and then as well we have a rural urban um, distribution in the survey results as well so I'd say about 60 percent of the respondents were rural and 40% uh, of them were from an urban background um, so the first thing that we did whenever we were looking at our focus groups we wanted to draw from our member organisations to create our focus groups. So our focus groups lasted about one hour or one hour and 30 minutes. Um, so we had uh, school student activists as well as teachers from different European countries to participate in the working groups or in the focus groups, sorry. And we always began the focus group by kind of breaking the ice a little bit by talking about the positives of school. Um, and it was really nice to have them talk about this like pre-pandemic times and how they enjoyed school whenever they were at this pre-pandemic level. Um, so it was really clear uh, to us that the transition to online education really made students view in-person education in a really positive light and kind of reminisce about the things that would have happened uh, whenever they were in school uh, because this this uh, these focus groups were done kind of in the height of the pandemic whenever most uh, countries had uh, school closures and a lot of our focus group and survey participants um, saw schools, community of teachers and students um, kind of entwined together and supporting each other and assisting each other and 
a lot of our participants mentioned that this was something they really missed about in-person school and that comes back as well to the NASET um, report of the whole school approach kind of this community of teachers and students working together um, in all aspects and I suppose especially in mental health to support each other as well so then they had the informal education so we were talking a lot about the extracurricular activities the school trips um, uh, the the extra stuff that happens in school, the informal education that happens just naturally as a result of being in that environment with other students and being in an environment with just um, talking to teachers, talking to other students, older students, younger students, and how that this is a, po a really positive thing that students really enjoyed about school, um, taking part in all these different kind of extracurricular activities and um, student activism. And this is something that they really thought was a huge positive about school and they're really they were really missing it during the online education um so even things like uh creating a school newspaper and everyone kind of getting together and buzzing about the school newspaper and um, so they pointed out that these are the kind of things that they really missed with um, education being online and of course as well and uh, the socializing aspect of school so a lot of students go to school to make friends and to meet their friends and to have that uh, social development and peer interaction so these are a lot of positives about school that kind of gone missing during the pandemic um, so moving online to the digital transition so we know that a lot of the students were left behind during the digital transition um, but it was interestingly enough uh, whenever we were talking to Estonian students they felt that they were kind of at an advantage over other countries in Europe um, because they had this great kind of technology already in place in Estonia and it's a technological leader that they felt that they transitioned quite smoothly into um, online education so that kind of seems to be the exception though because as if you look at the survey responses as well it seems that the most of the other countries explain how the internet connection was very bad and how it was difficult to join classes or upload work or um anything like anything to do with online education whenever their broadband wasn't working or they didn't have access to a um, computer or uh, other different kind of technology and we also looked at um, students access to education by considering three main factors and um, so the three main factors that we considered was their own personal space to have somewhere to um to study and to do their schoolwork in a, a quiet environment and another one thing was internet connection so um did they have internet connection at home and a personal device as well did they have uh, access to a laptop or a tablet or a computer or somewhere that they could do their homework and do their schoolwork and what we found was that a third of respondents don't have access to the three basic um needs i suppose for uh online education and um, so that was something that was really shocking for us uh, and another thing for us students with special educational needs so um we see that a lot of the time student with, students with students with special educational needs have been completely forgotten about um, in terms of online education so platforms are often not accessible to the students who have special educational needs and the barriers that these students face prior to online education um, has been completely exagger exaggerated during the pandemic and online education and another thing that came up time and time again during our research was staggered opening um, so this is something where uh, different students would come in at different times during the day and it was something that completely students would say that was really inaccessible for them especially for rural students who um, were trying to get transport in and out from school and at all times of the day it was just really they were messing up then on their uh, online education and couldn't access that and digital education has impacted the education of non-native language speakers as well and um, so more like immigrant students um people who don't speak the first language of the country in which they're being educated um so particularly those as well whose parents don't also speak the national language and it leaves them in a position of not really having the support at home and to deal with their education and to help them with um, their schoolwork or whatever the case may be and this paired alongside um lack of access to technology has been extremely detrimental to the education of these students and so just moving forward here now, we just have our tools that were used for, as you can see, like there's not much 
I mean, out of a thousand students, these are the um, responses for what they have access to on uh, on a daily basis. So you can see like only um, nine students have access to their to their own room. And it's just um, the fact that a third of them don't have access to the three basic requirements is um, completely shocking for us. Um, so moving forward with our recommendations, I just want to say first of all that our recommendations are not, um, these are not all of them, there's so much more in our in our report as well and it's up on our best on our website obesa.org if you would like to read it um, in fully. Um, but basically the first thing to mention is that school closures are a last resort. Um, so like removing the safe space um, for students um, that is school is absolutely should be the last resort and not ever the first response to the pandemic um that to put an end to this informal learning and the social growth um is just not what it should be considered first when we look at the pandemic and we should allow students to feel safe and students shouldn't be worried about their safety when they're in school so schools should be um have better infrastructure for the safe for safer schools so more ventilation and bigger classrooms and filtering systems so that students can be um can be safe in the school without the fear of catching an infection and as well equal distribution of resources so rural or migrant or special educational needs students should never be facing barriers to education um due to funding and resources being allocated and um, distributed unevenly and um, so that's just some of our uh, recommendations in digital transition but to move on quickly to student well-being uh, sorry to interrupt can can you wrap up please in around five minutes yeah perfect thank you um so just i'll just go for quickly here now and um, so the student well-being is what we've seen is that there has been extreme stress put on student well-being over the pan the course of the pandemic students uh, responding to our survey, which has been so shocking for us, is the only a tenth of the sample of the survey responses um, said that they felt positive and optimistic about the future. So that's only one out of ten said that they feel positive and optimistic about their future and themselves as well. Um, and there's so many causes of stress for students at the minute, which uh, is something that we think is completely acceptable. Um, so one of the huge one of the biggest stresses and we can see it also here in our um uh in our survey responses is stress at home or at school and um, so we don't see that school should be something that students should have to stress about and school and school stress should never be normalized either um moving on uh we can go forward to students' responses to their stress. Um, so we can see here that this is, again, our survey responses of how students are coping with their stress. And the main one at the top is to pursue hobbies and passions. And of course, with the pandemic, a lot of access to, uh, to hobbies and, and passions. And if it's something like sports, a lot of sports clubs has been closed during the pandemic and this kind of thing. And um, so again, this kind of removes that ability to um, relieve your stress and to to meet with friends and stuff to, to even talk about the stresses can be really difficult. And so our recommendations on uh, the mental health side of things actually much like the NESSET report. Um, so it's kind of like this community approach to mental health, so like a whole school approach, again, where you have um, students and the teachers coming together and there it should be normalised um, that Th this mental health is um, mainstreamed within schools and um, included in this like student participation should be included within the mental health um, re the, the removal of the mental health barriers and the second one is reduce stresses so that the school stress again should never be normalized and we should make the effort to reduce the amount of school stress and it should be done as well again with the whole school approach and uh, the one thing that we saw as a huge one was the free mental health counselling and um, so 20 percent of students said that they were facing financial stress as well as other kinds of stress and that they didn't have access to uh, free mental health or any kind of mental health counselling um, due to the financial barriers so we think it's really important that this is involved within schools as well 
Um, so just to conclude quickly is that I would really recommend reading the report um, if you have a chance. Uh, it's kind of long, but it is definitely worth it. And just to say as well that even now that things are going back to normal, we can see that so much remains uncertain for students and what they'll be facing and what their future and their education is going to look like um, over the coming years. And in this year's COMEM, in COMEM 2021, uh, we had a debrief of the research with our member organisations and the it's astounding the level of fear and the fact that there's still, still so much uncertainty, how much fear that's causing within our member organisations and students across Europe. Um, so yeah, uh, this was uh, made I suppose to kind of highlight the school, school student perspective on um, the COVID-19 pandemic and um, education during the pandemic and also um, mental health especially during the pandemic as well and um, so I hope that I've done it justice today and if uh, you have any questions please feel free to email me at any time my email's there as well and I think there's going to be time for questions now and Thank you. Thank you, Nadine, for uh, for this uh, also very uh, well uh, managed time and uh, and the quantity of information that uh, that you presented in, in such a short time was impressive. Uh, there are a few comments uh, in, in the chat uh, mentioning that these findings are very interesting and some participants are very much looking forward uh, into reading the full report. Um, there is also a question if uh, all EU governments have been informed uh, about these results. Uh, and uh, here perhaps you want to, to explain uh, very briefly how do you disseminate the results of, of your findings? Uh, yeah, so we present the this report to all European um, um, so European bodies like the European Commission, the European Union, etc. And then this is also shared with um, our member organisations who then share it with the national governments. So we have member organisations across Europe and they would use this report to advocate uh, with their national governments as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for that clarification. I believe that there are not many other questions in, in the chat, so uh, we can uh, still have a few more minutes uh, uh, before we finish, because I think we uh, we are uh, in front of very interesting and insightful presentations, and um, it would be a pity not to discuss them a little bit further. Uh, I would like also to make a comment while we, we receive more, uh, more questions uh, about um, both reports, in fact, but uh, particularly regarding the NESET report, uh, because I had this impression, as I, as I said a while ago, that uh, uh, this report is very comprehensive and it clearly shows us what needs to be done. Um, but uh, when we look at uh, these recommendations, and especially the 10 recommendations that, that were presented, sometimes perhaps it's difficult for for us or for teachers, for the school principals to imagine how they could implement uh, those recommendations. And I have the impression that uh, uh, Carmel and, and Slash, you have included in your report uh, also references to, to promising practices. Uh, how can, uh, can participants learn more about this, like uh, get inspired by what, uh, what other educational institutions are doing uh, regarding mental health and well-being? And of course, one of the, the ways of, of doing that is uh, looking uh, at the European Toolkit for Schools and uh, uh, the amazing resources that, uh, that are available there. But uh, I would like to, to hear uh, you more on this topic, especially as experts on this uh, topic of uh, mental health and, and well-being. Yeah, um, um, I can say something very briefly, but Celeste um, can also join me. So in the reports, we gave various um, examples and boxes and um, references to European projects like Erasmus Plus um, projects, which are working on uh, on promoting mental health in schools, like, for example, the project Promise, which is developing a whole school curriculum in mental health promotion from early years to to um, high school. And we also refer to other initiatives which are going on in various countries. 
Um, in the recommendations, they were quite brief. We also um, refer to what can be done um, in practical terms. And one way we recommend is that schools join and teachers, they join forces through collaborative platforms to share and learn from each other. Very, very important part, I think, is that the report provides a roadmap of how schools can organize themselves and mobilize their resources to create a whole school approach to mental health and well-being. However, it's very important we underlined that this process comes from a bottom-up approach where all the stakeholders, including the students at the very center, they discuss together, they do a needs analysis, what needs to be done for the school in terms of this framework which we proposed, how can we adapt that framework to our own needs and how we can then implement it. What resources do we need to have? So a sort of needs analysis. If we, if this process goes through this bottom up approach, through the involvement of the whole school community and in line with the ecology of the school, we think that it is more likely to be successful, feasible, but and also sustainable. Of course, it will need support by legislation, advocacy, support from the local educational authorities. So there needs also to be more awareness at higher level, okay, which underlines the important the importance of well-being in schools. And I think the initiatives being taken at the moment by the European Commission, um, such as the Pathways to School Success and the um, the development of a communication in the near future, the school, um, the European toolkit for schools, these are crucial resources which can be very helpful for schools in Europe. Thank you, Carmel, for your clarification. Perhaps uh, Celeste has anything to add? Well, I, I was just thinking about the, 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 the good practices that we have already. Uh, some of them are highlighted in the in the report. For instance, this uh, project that we highlight also in the report, the Promise project, uh, that is a, pro a project focus uh, especially on promoting mental health in school. Uh, and this a project is about to end in the, the next month, and it will end with uh, evidence on the its impact on uh, students on teachers, um, on their gain of social and emotional competencies, on resilience, on uh, mental health uh, uh, problems. So there are uh, uh, several good projects, several uh, practices uh, and best practices evaluated with a proper, uh, in, in a proper way uh, in several European countries. So that is also a good base for schools and school communities to, to get support and to move on to the implementation of these initiatives and in order them to be sustainable and promote positive outcomes for the whole school community. Thank you, Celeste. And uh, also now I will uh, hand over to Nadine with with the same question. I'm not sure if in your report you had this uh, um, uh, objective of uh, understanding or collecting also promising practices that the schools are doing. But even if you didn't, I'm sure that uh, in your work uh, at, at Obesu, uh, you you also map, uh, map these kind of practices and uh, uh, how they could uh, become, you know, more effective, more known to to sustain this implementation of of uh, mental health and well-being. Because as we saw with uh, with the question that we asked to to our participants, it seems that uh, mental health and well-being might uh, uh, be uh, more uh, present in in the lives of educational institutions, but they are still not tackled in uh, in a very consistent way. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you definitely, um, I agree completely with Carmen and Celeste there um, that this uh, sharing of best practices is 100% the best way to go about it. Uh, we do this often as well with our own member organisations uh, and topics like mental health and these kinds of things. Um, the idea that 
not everybody does it right but everyone has a way of doing it that is kind of right and together it can create something that uh, works really well and this taking different points of view into consideration and to create one kind of um way of going about things is very important um so that we can have that kind of again whole school approach and uh, everyone is on the same page about uh, how to react to these kinds of things and how to mainstream um, mental health and um, include mental health into um, education and into schools and into different institutions. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Nadine. Since we are uh, already 10 minutes uh, beyond our uh, initial planned time and there are uh, no questions uh, on, on the chat, I think it's it's time for us to to close this uh, this session. I would like to thank um, uh, again our participants Carmel Slash and Nadine for their very insightful presentations. Also to remind you that uh, both reports uh, um, uh, on which the their presentations were based are available online. Um, the links were already shared with you. If uh, you, you didn't take note of the links, it's enough to, to look uh, uh, online for Neset Network or Obesu, and uh, you will uh, very, very quickly uh, identify this, uh, these reports and you will uh, be able to consult them uh, in their uh, entirety. So uh, the full versions of the reports uh, are available. Also, now after this, uh, hearing these very, very interesting presentations and uh, uh, perhaps having this impression that we would like to know more on uh, on how we can we can actually do it, I would encourage you to consult some of the resources uh, on the European Toolkit for Schools, which are organized precisely according to this logic of the whole school approach that Carmel and Slash very, very clearly explained to us. Um, so, in the name of, uh, of the European Toolkit for Schools, the School Education uh, uh, Gateway, I would like to thank you all for, uh, for your participation uh, and wish you a great uh, weekend. Thank you.